All right. I think we are officially recording now. So what we're going to do, or what I'm going to do, because I'm talking to myself here, is we're going to go through a set of our notes. So I'm going to present a, uh, a PowerPoint here to you guys, and I'll just record it in the background. Um, and then I will upload this to um, Google Classroom so that you guys have a set of notes. Um, and hopefully um, this works and it will be a way for us to uh, kind of do notes and for me to give lecture while uh, you guys are at home. I would really like one day to, um, to be able to um, have some of you guys join this Google Meet and we can kind of do it together at the same time instead of me just recording. But for the first week, I figured <clears throat> it's probably better if I just record it by myself and then upload it for you guys just so that you guys have the information and, you know, we don't have to worry about getting people logged in and worried about mics and people, you know, talking over top of me and all that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> if this continues on into May, um, don't be surprised if I if I ask you to... Um, you know, to join and to um, be a part of a, of a lecture in the future. But for now, we'll do it like this and we'll see how it goes. So we are going to be starting World War II today. So officially, we're going to be getting into World War II. Um, before we left, before the, the Rona hit, we were talking about World War I and we were wrapping up World War I. We had talked about the League of Nations being created. We had talked about the Treaty of Versailles, which remember was that treaty that <clears throat> the Allied powers put into place that really punished Germany. You know, it made them give up a bunch of their military, a bunch of their land, a bunch of money in war reparations. So a lot of that stuff is going on in the world right now. There's a lot of tension. There's a lot of turmoil. The Great Depression has just happened. So nobody in the world has any money. There's panic across the globe. People are, you know, upset. They're panicked. They're worried. And they're looking for um, for answers. So let's get into this. So in the 1930s, events throughout the world are going to lead to conditions that start World War II. Just as a quick recap, here are some of our leaders that we need to uh, remember to keep an eye out for. So we've got Joseph Stalin in Russia. And remember, they're not calling themselves Russia anymore. They're now calling themselves the USSR or the Soviet Union because they have become communist. So you've got Joseph Stalin in Russia. You've got Adolf Hitler in Germany. You've got this guy named Benito Mussolini in Italy. You've got Francisco Franco in Spain. And then over in Japan, they've got a weird kind of setup. Um, they have an emperor, but they also have this guy right here. His name is Hideki Tojo. And he's um, the prime minister. He's the guy who really has all the power. So it's kind of like in Britain where they have a, a king or an emperor in Japan, but he doesn't really have any power. Instead, this guy, Hideki Tojo, really has all the power. And he's a military general, um, and he's kind of in charge of, of, of the show over there. In the world during this time, you've got high unemployment. People are desperate. They don't have jobs. They don't have money. They feel like they've been lied to by leadership. They feel like they've been lied to, especially by the Allies. Remember, if you think back to World War I and the Treaty of Versailles, Woodrow Wilson promised a fair deal for the world, right? He told the Germans that he would be fair to them. He told the Japanese that he would be fair to them. He told the Chinese he'd be fair to them. All of these people feel lied to and betrayed. And because of this, they're bitter, they're resentful, they're angry. And all of these feelings are going to lead to the rise of dictators, specifically totalitarian dictators. Remember the difference here. A dictator is just one person who runs the country by, by him or herself. A totalitarian dictator is one person who runs every aspect of the country. They tell you where you can live, how or what job you can have. In some cases, they tell you, you know, whether you can marry, what job you can have. So it can get pretty intense with these totalitarian dictators. Fascist dictators Mussolini and Hitler threatened the world to conquer new territories for Italy and Germany. Because remember, both of them did not get what they wanted out of World War I. Hitler wanted, um, or I'm sorry, Italy wanted um, a couple pieces of land to get them some new ports. Germany wanted to make sure that they didn't get treated like the enemy. Because remember, they never surrendered during World War I. 
it was an armistice, a ceasefire, but they never surrendered. So they felt like they had been um, betrayed by the Allies because they were supposed to negotiate as equals, and that never happened. Over in Japan, you've got this extreme nationalism, and we'll get into that more as we go through the through the unit. But Japan and the Japanese people have really bought into this idea that Japan is number one. Japan is the best. Nobody can mess with us. And you've got to remember, they've got some, some, uh, some events that happened to back this up. They had beaten Russia in the Russo-Japanese War back in the early 1900s. They had also beaten China, two really, really huge powers that before this time, Japan would have been you know, little brother, second fiddle, whatever you want to call it, to these countries. They're really coming into their own. They're strong. <clears throat> they're aggressive. They're expanding. And people are starting to take notice. And the Japanese people are starting to take notice as well. And they are really looking to expand and get new materials, raw materials, natural resources to grow their empire. And this guy that you see here, this is the, the prime minister and the general that's really in charge of Japan during, during this time. His name is Hideki Tojo. Now, by the 1930s, it's clear to some people, but not all, that the world is moving towards another war. People are upset. People are angry. People are trying to get what they can. Britain and France at this time are leaders of the League of Nations. Remember, the League of Nations was a group that was set together to um, kind of keep world peace, right? People could come there, they could mediate and talk out their problems to try and avoid another war. Britain and France both do not want another war. They are willing to do whatever it takes to avoid another war, whatever it takes to avoid another war. And this is going to be a problem because when you do whatever it takes to avoid another war, some complications and some problems are going to pop up because of it. The USA, on the other hand, across the sea, on the other side of the world, is focused on the Great Depression. We don't want to get involved with Europe. Remember, we didn't want to get involved with Europe during the First World War. We were kind of pulled in because of um, Germany attacking our ships. We don't want to get involved in this, in this problem over in Europe. That's their problem. They handle it. We're going to focus on ourselves. Remember, what is that called? When we focus on ourselves only? That's right, isolationism, okay? So we're isolationists right now. We're trying to avoid these foreign affairs. We're trying to avoid Europe. We don't want any of their problems. So we're going to stay away. Japan, Italy, and Germany are going to start to aggressively expand in Africa, Asia, and Europe. And then in 1936, these three countries are going to form an alliance, and they're going to be called the Axis Coalition. The reason why they call themselves the Axis Coalition is because, you know, they come up with this idea that the world is going to revolve around them. You know how, like, the world kind of revolves on its axis? So they're the Axis Coalition because the world is going to revolve around them. You can see pictures of our three, uh, our, our three dictators here. So you've got Hideki Tojo here in his military getup. You've got Mussolini, Benito Mussolini, here in the middle. And then we've got Adolf Hitler over here on the right. Notice they're all dressed up in military fatigue. They're all dressed up in, you know, the, the dress of the military because they use the military as a form of power and control. Down here at the bottom, you've got a quick little timeline. It kind of shows you what happens when. So early, early, early on, 1931, this is before World War One, or I'm sorry, World War II is even close to starting. Japan is already invading other countries. It says there that Japan invades Manchuria. Manchuria is part of China. So Japan is invading China. Here in the middle, you've got um, Italy attacking Ethiopia. That's a country in Africa. Down here, you've got Germany occupies the Rhineland. The Rhineland is a part of Europe that was very close by Germany. Germany had owned it before World War I. They lost it in the Treaty of Versailles to France. Okay. In 1937, Japan officially invades China. Germany is annexing Austria. Germany is seizing this country called Czechoslovakia, which I can show you on a map here in a little bit. Germany takes the Sudetenland, and then Italy conquers Albania. So you can see, even before World War II starts, there's a lot of stuff that's happening here. And this comes back to Britain and France wanting to avoid a war at all costs. 
All of this stuff should have and could have been prevented. Instead, what we see is Britain and France are allowing um, these three countries to take advantage of them because of their lack of willingness to put their foot down, stand up to these guys and say, no, listen, if you take this land, if you do this to these countries, we're going to go to war with you. They wouldn't do it. And we get this timeline um, because of it. So let's talk about Japan and let's talk about their invasions. So in 1931, Japan invades Manchuria to seize iron and coal. Japan, if you look at it on the map here, it's a tiny little island. It's not very big. If you compare it to a state, it's probably about the size of mm, New Jersey, maybe. Okay, so that maybe the size of New Jersey. Um, and they've already taken Korea, so they've got a little bit more there. Um, but they are expanding incredibly quickly. They need raw material, specifically iron, coal, and gas. They're going to expand into Manchuria, which is this northern part of China right here. Okay, so here's China. Here's Manchuria. It's the northern part of China. They're going to invade Manchuria and conquer it. In 1937, they're going to decide that they're going into China officially. So they march down into China, Peking, Nanking, Beijing, <clears throat> and they're going to come to the city of Nanjing, way down here. Okay. I know it looks like Nanking. But, you know, Chinese, there's a couple different ways that you could pronounce stuff in Chinese. They pronounce it Nanjing. So uh, down here in Nanjing, the Japanese are actually going to conquer the city. And then they are going to have a field day with the civilian population. They, the Japanese are very, very good at instilling fear um, as their form of power and authority and control, right? We're going to control the people of China by showing them what happens if you don't do what you're supposed to do. So in Nanjing, what happens is the Japanese government gives their soldiers the go-ahead to rape, kill, murder, burn hundreds of thousands of unarmed soldiers and civilians. We're talking about men, women, children. What resulted is one of the worst massacres um, in peacetime, right? Because World War II has not started yet. One of the worst massacres in peacetime in history. And you wind up with a lot of scenes like this. Um, so you've got a pile of bodies here. And the Japanese love to decapitate people. Um, it goes back to their days as samurai. So what they would do is they would make people kneel before them. They would chop their heads off. And then they would pile the skulls up, the heads up in a big pile. So you can see the pile of skulls down there. And then they'd throw the bodies together and they'd burn it all. So you wind up with these huge piles of skulls, these huge piles of bodies. It's really, really, really nasty stuff. If you're interested, you can always do some more reading. Um, and some more investigation into the rape of Nanjing. Um, I will probably have some videos and maybe a reading or two for you in the coming weeks about it. Um, but it's 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 really interesting. But it's really some brutal, brutal stuff that the Japanese do during World War, or before World War II. On the other side of the world, let's take a look at Italy now. So we've got Italy up here in Europe. And Mussolini has promised his people that he is going to get them some land because remember that was one of the things they wanted out of world war one that they didn't get so in 1935 mussolini is going to begin um, his campaign to create an, an italian empire and he wants to do this first by invading ethiopia down here okay because you can see the dark purple the really really dark purple that's land that italy already had the light purple so we see ethiopia and then albania up here right the light purple is what <clears throat> um, Italy is going to take over before World War II starts. So they're going to start down here in Africa, and they're going to take over Ethiopia. The Italians are easily able to defeat the Ethiopians because, again, remember, you've got the Italians who are now we're in World War II, so we've got tanks and bombs and airplanes and, and, and fighter planes and bombers and all this kind of stuff, right? We've got pretty much modern weaponry at this point. And then as you look at the Ethiopians, they're still riding horses. Um, they do have guns, but they're still wearing shields. The technology difference is just too great. And the um, Italians are able to defeat the Ethiopians pretty easily. 
Um, usually we do this in class together, but obviously I'm sitting here talking to myself right now. So we will skip the decision stuff, right? But I want to talk about the question and then um, the decision that they make, right? So the question is, how should the League of Nations have responded here? <clears throat> and hopefully you're sitting here thinking, well, why didn't they do more to stop these guys, right? Why didn't they step in and tell Japan, no, you can't have this land? Why didn't they step in and tell Italy, no, you can't conquer Ethiopia? No, you can't go into Albania? Well, the League of Nations, what they do is they condemn the Japanese and Italian aggression. So basically, they tell them, no, 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 hey, you guys shouldn't be doing that. <clears throat> That's not very nice. You know, you should probably stop that. You should really stop and think about your decisions right? The problem is they don't have any backbone. They're not stepping up to the plate and saying, listen, if you do this, we're going to move troops to your country, right? So because of this, these countries realize, well, these guys aren't going to do anything to us. We can do whatever we want. So they tell them to stop, but they don't do anything to make them stop. Hitler sees this and Hitler goes, well, hold on a second now. If Italy and Japan are getting away with taking land, why can't I? So the failure of the League of Nations really encourages Hitler to start doing the same thing for Germany, to expand Germany. In 1935, Hitler defies the Treaty of Versailles and expands the German military. Remember, they were only allowed to have 100,000 troops in their army. He takes that and he ramps that up into the millions. He's uh, recruiting people into the military. He's starting to build weapons again. He's creating guns and tanks and bombs and submarines. He's doing everything that the Treaty of Versailles told him not to because he knows that Italy or France and, the, and Britain are not going to stop him. In 1936, he says, all right, it's time to take some land. So he comes over here to this place called the Rhineland, and he moves his army into it. France had been given this. Okay, so France had been given this, this area called the Rhineland. Germany is like, no, that's ours. It belongs to us. We're going to take it back. Does France and, Ger or, and Great Britain stop him? No, they don't. So both times the League of Nations refuses to stop Hitler in order to keep peace in Europe because they're so afraid of another world war. In 1938, he moves down here to Austria. And he annexes the entire country. Remember, annex means to bring in, right? Or to absorb it. So in 1938, he annexes the entire country of Austria. He just says, hey, this is ours now. It's part of Germany. And the Austrian people, you might be thinking, well, didn't they fight back? No, they didn't. Because a lot of these people were German. They spoke German. They felt like they were German. So Austria welcomed Hitler with open arms. They threw parades. Um, Hitler marched up and down the street in a car and they were throwing flower petals on him and all kinds of stuff. So Hitler is able to go into Austria and take it with very little resistance. And again, you might be sitting here thinking, well, didn't Britain and France try and stop him? No, they didn't. They let him have it. Next, you've got um, Hitler demanding the western border of this country called Czechoslovakia. And it's an area specifically known as the Sudetenland. So if you look at Czechoslovakia here, there's this little dotted line. It's everything on the outside of that dotted line. It's called the Sudetenland. <clears throat> and a lot of the people in this area spoke German. It had been a part of Germany before World War I. And again, the people there are happy to be back with Germany. So they're not going to put up a big fight because that's where they want to be anyway. They want to be German. How do you think the League of Nations should have responded to this? Hopefully you're sitting here thinking, man, they should have stepped up to the plate. They should have done something. They should have said something. They should have stopped them. They should have, you know, um, put up a fight, something, right? Anything. What are we going to do to stop this guy? Instead, here's what they do. So in 1938, <clears throat> leaders from England and France meet with Hitler and Mussolini at Munich, which is a city in Germany, and it's called the Munich Conference, in order to work out an agreement to, to war. So here you see the leader from Great Britain. His name is Neville, Neville Chamberlain. And then you've got Adolf Hitler here. And they're going to try and work out an agreement to avoid war. So, okay, at least they're meeting together and they're talking, right? 
So Britain and France use this thing called appeasement. This is going to be one of your vocab words this week. So you need to make sure that you know this one because this word is super, super, super important. It's called appeasement. Appeasement means you give somebody something to make them go away, right? It's like when um, you have a little kid, right? So I've, you know, this whole quarantine thing, I've been stuck with my uh, my two-year-old this entire time. And, you know, sometimes you're just sitting there and you're like, oh my goodness, what do you want? You want a piece of chocolate? All right, I'll give you a piece of chocolate if you leave me alone for five minutes, right? It's that kind of idea. You give them something to make them go away, to leave you alone. So what Britain and France do is they use this idea of appeasement with Hitler. They give in to his demands in order to avoid war. So Hitler says, hey, I want the Rhineland. They say, okay, yeah, sure. He says, hey, we want Austria. They say, okay, yeah, sure. Hey, we want the Sudetenland. Yeah, okay, sure, right? They do this over and over and over again. And time after time, Hitler says, all right, I'm done. I'm not going to take any more, right? I've taken the Rhineland. All right, I'm done. I've taken Austria. Okay, I'm done. I've taken the Sudetenland. Okay, I'm done. Six months after the Munich conference, Hitler is going to break his promise and annex all of Czechoslovakia. So Britain and France had met with Hitler. They signed an agreement. You can see Chamberlain here holding up this piece of paper, right? That's the signed agreement. Hitler agrees that I am not going to conquer any more land. Yeah, right. Well, six months later, he annexes the rest of Czechoslovakia. In 1939, Hitler demands that Western Poland, this area right here where my cursor is, Western Poland be returned to Germany. But there's a catch here. Who's on the other side of Poland? That's right. Russia or the Soviet Union, as it's now known. Germany did not want to fight Joseph Stalin because here's the thing. He knew he could push Britain and France around. He also knew that Stalin was crazy enough that if uh, if Hitler had made the Soviet Union angry, Stalin would have gone to war with him immediately because Stalin is just as crazy as the rest of the dictators. He's communist instead of um, fascist, but he's still a dictator nonetheless. And he's crazy enough to fight back if Germany does something to tick him off. So he did not want to start a war with the Soviet Union. <clears throat> so instead, Hitler meets with Stalin and they have this agreement. It's called the Nazi Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. Non-aggression means, hey, we're not going to fight each other, right? I'm not going to be aggressive towards you. They promise never to attack each other. Secretly, the USSR and Germany agreed to divide Poland. And you can see some political cartoons here that kind of show the agreement. So you've got Hitler over here. And remember, these guys don't really like each other. They're just working with each other to get what they want, which is land. So you've got Hitler here saying the scum of the earth, I believe. And then Stalin over here, the bloody assassin of the workers, I presume. So they don't really like each other, but they're kind of getting along because they want the same things. And then here you've got a cartoon, a political cartoon with... um. With Hitler and Stalin getting hitched, you know, and the, the caption is, wonder how long the honeymoon will last. So people realize that this probably isn't going to last forever, but they're using this to get what they want, which is land. On September 1st, 1939, Hitler ordered the German military to attack Poland. This country right here where my cursor is. And it is a stomp. It is an absolute massacre. The Nazi uh, war machine is far and away superior to Poland. <clears throat> they crush Poland in the matter of a couple weeks. It's barely even a fight. So how should Britain and France respond? Okay, They've given up the Rhineland. They've given up Austria. They've given up the Sudetenland. They've given up all of Czechoslovakia. Now Germany and the USSR have made a pact not to fight each other. Germany has officially invaded for the first time now. This is a, an official of invasion. Poland fought back. The other countries didn't really. There was some you know, minor um, skirmishes here and there, but the other countries, for the most part, did not fight back. Poland does. 
They do not want to be a part of Germany. How should Britain and France respond? Well, after all of that, they finally declare war on Germany. It takes all of this land, <clears throat> including Poland, right? It takes all of that land for France and Britain to finally step up to the plate and say, all right, listen, enough's enough. But the problem is by the time Britain and France decide to make any moves, look how big Germany has become. They've got most of Central Europe under their control already. And when you add into the fact that Italy's their ally, and now so is the Soviet Union, they're huge. This is a huge problem now. <clears throat> now, once World War II has started, um, we call it a two-theater war. And we call it a two-theater war because there's going to be a lot of fighting happening over here in Europe which is where my cursor is right now. But there's also going to be a lot of fighting taking place over in the Pacific, which is over here. Europe is going to be primarily focused on Germany, Italy, um, Britain, France, and Russia. The Pacific theater is going to be mainly focused on the United States and Japan. The Allies and Axis powers convert to total war for the second time in 20 years. Remember, total war is where you stop producing washers and dryers and cars and you start making tanks and bombs and guns and um, you know all that stuff that you need for war. You start rationing. You start ramping up propaganda. Remember, propaganda is where you try and convince people of something that you want them to believe in. So you start doing all that kind of stuff. And you're also drafting or conscripting. Remember, that's involuntary service in the military. My young men in, in, the, in the lecture, remember, when you turn 18, you have to sign up for the draft. It's the law, right? <clears throat> so we are now officially back in total war. When World War II begins, Germany uses a strategy called lightning war. Okay, that's what it is in English. The Germans have a name for it. They call it blitzkrieg. Okay, in English, that means lightning war. So they have this strategy called Blitzkrieg. It relies on fast, strong attacks using air raids, artilleries, and tanks. And here are some pictures of some of the weapons that you would have seen during World War II. So like I said, we have legit modern weaponry during World War II. It was <clears throat> not uncommon to see you know, tanks from World War II being used all the way up into the 80s and 90s. A lot of it has been replaced now. There are still some countries that are using World War II tanks and, and weaponry and stuff like that. So it, it's not, um, we're not talking about old school weapons anymore. We're talking about new modern weapons that are still used in some parts of the world today. By 1940, Germany has spread their tendrils out across Europe and have conquered most of the continent. <clears throat> when you look at the map here, the blue are people who are going to be the allied powers, the people who the United States join, right? The yellow is going to be either people who were a part of the Axis or people who have become controlled by the Axis. And remember, the Axis is Germany, Italy, and Japan, right? You might be sitting yourself thinking, well, why is uh, why is Russia blue? We'll get to that in a minute, but eventually to join the side of the allies. <clears throat> um, before you know it, you look at the map of Europe and it's entirely yellow for the most part. You've got a couple green countries. These are countries that stayed neutral, that did not fight. But most of Europe has been conquered by the, uh, by the Axis powers. <clears throat> and one place that... Um, is it particularly important is France. France falls during World War II, and they fall pretty quickly, by the way. There's some stuff in your reading this week that goes into more detail about the fall of France, but you can see here you've got pictures of Hitler walking under the Eiffel Tower. Um, you've got German troops marching up and down the main streets of Paris by the Louvre and all these you know, famous French architecture and all this kind of stuff. Germany knocks at France. Very vaguely. Part of the it is part of Europe that has been conquered. This did not happen in World War One. It happens very quickly in World War Two, and the world panics because they're like, "Oh boy, we did not expect this to happen, and we definitely didn't expect it to happen so quickly." Um, and you can see here some French citizens who are crying because they are now having to salute to Hitler. 
they're you know they're doing the Heil Hitler sign to 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 the Nazi soldiers as they're walking through because they ha- they realize now that they have been conquered and they have lost. Um, in 1940, Germany turns its attention to the last remaining um, Allied power in Europe because remember we haven't talked about the Soviet Union joining yet. So right now. Britain or the United Kingdom is the last man standing. They have conquered all of Europe except for Britain. So Germany begins a massing bombing campaign using its air force called the Battle of Britain. Sometimes you'll also see it called the Blitz. So Brit- or Britain is the last man standing, and Germany has concentrated its efforts towards it. And they're trying to soften up Britain by bombing them. The British Air Force, also known as the RAF, the Royal Air Force, the RAF, um, they fight back using radar, and then eventually they crack German codes using this thing called the Enigma machine, so they're able to read where the Germans are actually going to bomb and attack, and using this, they're actually able to fight back a little bit. The Prime Minister of Great Britain at this time is now Winston Churchill, this guy over here. And he vows that the British would never surrender. We'll fight them in the land. We'll fight them on the sea. We'll fight them on the ground. We will never, never, never surrender. You start to get some pictures showing up from England and London and and from the United Kingdom as a whole that look like this. So you've got tons of Nazi planes flying over these British cities, and they are just bombing them uh, into submission. So here you can see the famous um, clock tower, Big Ben, and around it, the city is burning. They, the British were, I'm sorry, the Germans were not um, shy about what they bombed. They would bomb hospitals, they would bomb schools, they would bomb transportation systems. They weren't looking for military targets, they were looking for to kill the most amount of people as they possibly could. <clears throat> entire cities would burn every single night for a month you would hear an air raid siren in a city in England you'd get up everybody if you were a citizen in England you would get up you'd take a pillow and a blanket you'd go to your nearest subway station and you would set up camp for the night down there because once an air raid siren went off you had to evacuate your home You went down into the subway systems, and that's where you slept for the night. You try and find a a spot. You know, some people are down here sleeping on the on the tracks. Some people are up here on the on the um, the sidewalk or whatever you want to call it. They would shut the trains down for the night so people wouldn't obviously get run over while they're sleeping or whatever. But this is what people did every single night for a month. Try and put yourself in the shoes of these people who are sitting here in. Um, in these subway systems, wondering if when they go up uh, in the morning, when they go back up uh, above ground, are they going to have a house? Are they? Is their car going to be destroyed? Is their house going to be burnt to the ground? Are they going to have their, their money and their possessions and all this kind of stuff? And just think about having that worry every single night for a month, never knowing if you're going to walk up and see your house be destroyed by a bomb. After eight months, Hitler calls off the attacks, and he focuses on Eastern Europe. Meanwhile, over in our neck of the woods with the United States, we vow that we're going to remain neutral. So you start to see some uh, political cartoons and propaganda like this pop up. So you've got Uncle Sam and Lady Liberty here, and we're saying, no, we're going to stay out of it, da-da-da. And then across the world, you see you know, Europe burning. Um, after the fall of France and uh, the attacks on Britain, the U.S. says, all right, we can't sit by and do nothing. We've got to do something. So what they start doing is they start selling war supplies to the Allied powers. It's called the Lend-Lease Program. And you can see here on these um, little cargo crates or cargo containers, it, they all say the Lend-Lease, right? So what we, what we did is we sent supplies to the Allies, but we didn't send troops. <clears throat> and we sent a lot of supplies too. If you look at the numbers over to China, 1.3 million dollars um, to Africa, the Middle East, and the Mediterranean, almost two million to Russia, almost three million to the United Kingdom, uh, 5.2 million dollars. So we're sending a ton of supplies and a ton of money to these countries, but we're not sending troops, which is what they need the most. 
1940, Italy and Germany um, take troops down to North Africa, down here in this area, and they start to take control of Africa. Meanwhile, Hitler is going to take control of the Balkans, this area down in here. Remember, that's where World War I starts with um, Gavrilo Princip um, assassinating the Archduke from Austria-Hungary, Franz Ferdinand. So uh, Hitler has now officially taken over the Balkans. In 1941, Hitler makes a big mistake. Hitler attacks the Soviet Union. You've got to remember, the Soviet Union and Hitler had a pact that they weren't going to attack each other, right? The reason this is a mistake is because they have not beaten Britain yet. So they're leaving Britain alone on one side of the world, and now they're attacking Russia on the other side. What did they just do? They created a two-front war. Remember, back in War One. That was the huge thing that Germany wanted to avoid. They didn't want a two-front war at all because they knew that it would split their troops and it would force them to focus in too many areas at once. Well, Hitler does it voluntarily. It's called Operation Barbosa. He does it voluntarily. He chooses to start a two-front war. Before Britain is beaten, he turns around and attacks Stalin. Huge mistake. One of the biggest mistakes Hitler makes in the war. He stabs him in the back. And he uh, attacks him. <clears throat> By 1942, the Axis powers control most of Europe, except for Great Britain. Most of North Africa, except for Egypt. and um, were, But they were unable to defeat Britain. So you can see the United Kingdom is still sitting here and they're still blue. And they're unable to beat Russia. And they're still sitting here and they're still blue. All right, let's change gears and jump over to the Pacific now. Let's talk about Japan. From 1939 to 1941, Japan is going on an absolute killing spree. They are conquering places left and right. And they actually get so big so fast that they start running out of places to really attack without upsetting people. They start to threaten U.S. colonies of Guam and the Philippines. They are moving at an incredibly fast pace. How do you think the United States should respond to this? Well, here's how. Well, here's what they actually do. Okay, so in 1941, the United States says, "Fine, you want to start doing all this stuff. You want to start <clears throat> messing with our colonies. We're just going to cut off all of your iron and oil." Remember, Japan, tiny little island, not a lot of resources. That's one of the main reasons why they're expanding. Right? They're looking for oil. They're looking for iron. They're looking for coal. Well, the United States had been selling them a bunch of this stuff. They say, all right, we're done. No more iron, no more oil. You're cut off. The Japanese look at this embargo as a direct threat to their ability to expand because without oil, without iron, they can't make, um, you know, the weapons. They can't, um, they can't pilot their boats and their planes and all this other stuff. So they look at it as a, as a direct um, attack on their ability to expand. So, in response to this, the Japanese come up with a plan. They are going to launch a secret surprise attack on the largest U.S. naval base in um, Hawaii at a naval base called Pearl Harbor. The surprise attack works, and it cripples the U.S. Navy and kills 2,300 Americans. Um, we'll watch some videos and some stuff about Pearl Harbor. There's plenty of information that we'll get into about Pearl Harbor. But the Japanese are pretty successful in their attack. The U.S. gets lucky in a couple different ways. One, our aircraft carriers weren't in harbor. And um, they weren't able to hit a couple other key places at the military base or at the naval base. So we got a little lucky. But for a long time, the United States has no Navy now because most of our ships were stationed here at Pearl Harbor. After the attack, the USA has no choice. We have to declare war on the Axis powers, and we officially enter World War II. Here you can see a couple um, pieces of propaganda that pop up in the United States. You know, avenge Pearl Harbor, our bullets will do it. Over here, you've got a, a tattered flag. It kind of is supposed to make you think about the national anthem. You know, bombs overhead, the flag still stands, the flag's still waving, right? <clears throat> it's supposed to be patriotic, nationalistic, get you proud of your country. Hey, we've got to pull together so that we can go and fight. After Pearl Harbor, the Japanese 
um, realize that they no longer have to worry about the United States for the time being because they just crippled our Navy. So they take the Philippines, um, they go into India, they start to threaten India, and they start to threaten Australia. You can see here on this map, this yellow line kind of indicates all of the places that Japan has taken, and they're pushing down into Australia. By 1942, Japan controls a large empire in the Pacific, and they call Asia for the Asian. Basic thing is we're trying to kick all Europeans and all the Americans out. It's going to be the Japanese time to control all of this stuff. From 1939 to 1942, the Axis powers, which are, remember, Germany, Italy, Japan, dominate Europe, North Africa, and Asia. But 1942 is going to be a turning point for the Allies, who are eventually going to win this war. And we will get into that when I sit down and talk about part two of World War II. So there's a lot of information here. I know this. Okay, I know there's a lot of information that I just uh, gave you. I know that um, it's a lot to kind of digest and take in at one time. You don't have to sit here and watch this whole presentation in one go. Split it up if you want. Do it over the week. Um, you know, if you want to, you know, sit down and listen to five, ten minutes of it um, every day, that's fine. That's great. That's probably what I would suggest to do. If you're bored and you want to sit and listen to me talk about World War II for what did we do this for? Twenty minutes, thirty minutes, something like that. That's great too. You know, I I, I think that's fantastic. Um, I will upload this. I will upload the PowerPoint, and I will upload the guided note sheet where you're actually going to fill in the blanks all on the same post so that you have all of this information. Um, let me know how this went. If you liked it, if you thought it was crap, if you thought it was great, if you think um, being inside the, the Google meet with me while I do it so that you can ask questions and interact and all that kind of stuff would be good. Let me know. I need feedback. I want feedback. You know, um, it's your, it's your stuff. So we've got to make it work for you. It's not mine. Like I always say, you know, I know this stuff. I've, I've done this for a while now, right? So it's not me that needs this information. It's you guys. So if this format didn't work, if you didn't like this, you got to let me know because I can change it. I will change it. We'll do something different, but I've got to know because if I don't know, then I can't change it because I don't know that it's not working for you. So let me know. If comments, feedback, private comments, public comments. And um, you can just post to the to the link so your other classmates can see it so they can kind of get an idea of what <clears throat> what you thought too. start having discussions on Google Classroom. You are allowed to type on there. You're allowed to communicate with each other. This is a, a, a platform for you guys. It's not for me. This is where I post stuff, but it's not my platform. It's your platform. So if you want to change stuff, if you want to comment on stuff, if you think things need to be different or better or worse or whatever. Let me know. You got to let me know. We got to talk. I miss talking to you guys. I'm sitting up here in uh, in my room talking to myself. You know, what am I doing? I got Jason Momo in the background over there. You guys see, J hi, Jason. Hi, Aquaman. Look at me. I'm talking to, I'm talking to, to, to people in the wall. They're not even real now, right? So you got to talk to me. You got to let me know. All right. Okay. Let's stop this recording now. I think it's gone on long enough, huh? Stay safe. Do your work. Let me know if you need any help. I love y'all. See you later.